it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Gambetta, who um, studied biology at the University of Geneva um, and followed it up with a joint PhD between the MBL in Heidelberg here and the, in the, the University of Geneva as well. After graduation, uh, she moved to uh, the lab of George Müller to study the molecular mechanism of polycomb replication. She then briefly came back to EMBL for a postdoc in the lab of Ariel Forlong, where she started studying the role of protein architecture and insulator proteins in gene expression regulation. Since 2018, she is assistant professor at the Center for Integrative Genomics at the University of Lausanne, where her lab works on long distance uh, promoter regulation and how chromatin structure and insulator proteins are involved in the uh, process, which is something I think we'll hear more soon. So we are really happy to have you here and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Matteo. Okay, so thanks again to the Fragile Nucleosome community for the opportunity to present our work. I hugely admire uh, your, your organizers and your regular attendees because this is an excellent initiative that allows many of us to share science in the community. So we're interested in how gene expression patterns arise, like in these examples of developmental gene expression patterns in fly embryos that are critical for development. So more specifically, we're asking how are genes regulated without undesirable crosstalk? So transcription from gene promoters is controlled by regulatory elements like enhancers or silencers that turn genes on or off at the right time in the right cells. And uh, we know a lot about where promoters and regulatory elements are in genomes. And now the challenge is to connect regulatory elements to their target genes, which is not trivial because regulatory elements don't always regulate the closest gene. So, you know, sorry, it has been debated whether chromosome folding into contact domains, also known as TADs, helps regulatory elements find their target genes in the same domain and prevents them from contacting genes in the, in the other domains. So contact domains are visualized by HiC that generates heat maps showing how close two sequences are in 3D space. So loci within a contact domain are equally close to each other in three dimensions and they're separated from loci, you know, by, by boundaries. So in mammals, many contact domains are, uh, many contact domain boundaries are formed by, you know, when a sequence specific DNA binding protein called TPCF stalls chromosomal loop extruding cohesion. And uh, so clean genetic deletion of TPCF is not possible in mammalian cells because they die. So instead, TTCF protein has been depleted in mammalian cells by Elphege Nora and many other labs. And this results in weaker fuzzy boundaries. So to what extent TTCF depletion leads to a regulatory crosstalk has been challenging to address in mammals because completely removing TTCF kills cells. And uh, locus specifically perturbing CTCF binding sites has led to very different effects depending on the locus. So we figured that understanding, trying to understand the biological relevance of contact domains in flies could advance our fundamental understanding of why genomes fold into contact domains. So in contrast to mammals, CTCF only blinds to about 10% of boundaries in flies. And other DNA binding proteins like suppressor hairy wing, B32 and others bind at other boundaries, okay? And so there's two main categories of fly boundaries. The most abundant, 75% of all boundaries are promoter boundaries because they're found at uh, usually at divergently transcribed housekeeping gene promoters. And the remaining non-promoter boundaries are bound by CTCF, suppressor hairy wing and other proteins. But promoter and non-promoter boundaries all have one thing in common. They're all bound by a protein called CP119. And interestingly, all of these proteins that bind to boundaries were originally described as insulator proteins. And insulator proteins are thought to prevent regulatory crosstalk. 
So we wanted to address how do boundaries form and what is their function? To do this, we generated flies that completely lack CTCF or CP190 or both and asked what happens to contact domains and to gene transcription. So we generated what we call zero mutants that completely lack either CP190, CTCF, or both proteins. And so in this anti-CP190 and anti-CTCF Western blots on early embryo extracts, you can see that if you just make a knockout animal, these knockout animals, they lack zygotic, for example, protein like CP190, but they have the maternally deposited protein that was given to them by their heterozygous mothers. And in contrast, zero mutants that we're using, they lack zygotic and maternal protein. So CP190 zero mutants had normal levels of CTCF and CTCF zero mutants had normal levels of CP190 and double zero mutants lacked both. So we then did HiC and ChIP-seq on our zero mutants. So this is a high c map in wild type embryos looking at a Hox gene cluster called the Antenopedia cluster. And you can see that these Hox genes are organized into contact domains and that CP190 binds at the boundaries of these domains. So in CP190 zero mutants, some contact domain boundaries have disappeared and others have become fuzzy. And CP190 is no longer detectable. We only see some non-specific signals in the chip. And subtracting the wild type high C map from the CP190 mutant high C map highlights increased interdomain contacts that you can see in red between domains in the mutants. So CP190 is therefore required to form robust boundaries at this locus, but what about genome wide? So the answer is here, in which each row is one of all 2,334 contact domain boundaries that we mapped in wild type embryos by HiC. And the boundaries are ranked by how severely they're affected in CP190 mutants. Okay, so boundaries that were lost in the mutant are at the top. And we're looking in a 50 KB region centered on the boundary. And so wherever you see a black pixel, that means that a boundary was present. You can see that overall 22% of boundaries that are present in wild type were lost in CP190 mutants. And we also measured uh, boundary strength computationally. And so boundaries that were weaker in the mutants relative to wild type are red. And overall, 25% of boundaries were either lost or strongly weakened in CP190 mutants. So CP190 dependent boundaries were distal to transcribed promoters. As you can see in this column, in which blue, blue dots you know, are marking the presence of transcribed promoters. And you can see that in contrast, CP190 independent boundaries, which are the remaining 75%, they are you know, proximal, they are promoter proximal. And so we concluded that CP190 is required to form most non-promoter boundaries. And data from Nicola Iorino's lab suggests that promoter boundaries their formation actually relies on transcription itself. So nevertheless, CP190 binds to both types of boundaries. But CP190 is not thought to bind DNA directly. So how is it recruited to these boundaries? So we looked at CP190 chip peaks that were reduced in, in CTCF mutants. These are these purple dots or in suppressive hairy wing mutants. And we saw that CP190 is recruited to different CP190 dependent boundaries by either CTCF or suppressor carry wing. And these results made sense with the underlying motifs in boundary DNA. So you can see that, for example, CTCF and suppressor carry wing motifs are enriched in the boundaries at which you know, these proteins recruit CP190, whereas other DNA motifs like that of B32 which are known to be enriched in promoter boundaries were enriched in the CP190 independent boundaries. So these results suggested that CP190 was required for the ability of CTCF to form boundaries, which at first we were a little bit surprised about because in mammals, CTCF 
is thought to directly by itself form a boundary to loop extruding cohesion. So we tested this hypothesis. So if CP190B is indeed required for CTCF's ability to form boundaries, then CTCF dependent boundaries should also depend on CP190. So I'll show you what we found. So here's an example of a boundary that's bound by both CTCF and CP190 as also shown in this cartoon. In CTCF mutants, CTCF is completely gone and CP190 is lost from former CTCF peaks, but it's still present at sites where it binds independently of CTCF, showing that CTCF recruits CP190 to its sites. So this boundary was gone, showing us that it's a CTCF dependent boundary. In CP190 mutants, CP190 is gone from all sites, but CTCF can still bind to DNA normally. Yet despite CTCF binding to DNA, the boundary was strongly weakened. So this showed that CTCF indeed recruits CP190 to form robust boundaries. So we can speculate further that if CP190 is required for CTCF's ability to form boundaries, then only CTCF bound sites that are co-bound by CP190 should be boundaries. So to check this, we ranked all CTCF chip peaks that we identified in wild type embryos by their chip occupancy. Okay, so the most strongly bound CTCF chip peaks are at the top. So does CP190 always co-localize with CTCF? No. For reasons that we don't understand, CP190 only co-binds with CTCF at high and low occupancy chip peaks, but not at intermediate CTCF chip peaks. So now if you look at where are the boundaries, you see that only CTCF peaks that are co-bound by CP190 are present at domain boundaries. And so our second prediction was fulfilled. Okay, so now that I've shown you that CTCF and CP190 are required to form boundaries. In fact, CP190 is now currently one of the major players that we know of that's required for fly boundary formation. The next question is, well, what is, what is the consequence of disrupting boundaries for transcriptional regulation? So when we looked for differentially expressed genes, we found that some genes near CTCF and CP190 co-bound boundaries were similarly upregulated in both CTCF and CP190 mutants or similarly downregulated in both mutants. So this could have suggested that CTCF and CP190 directly repress some genes and directly activate others, or CTCF and CP190 might be insulating genes, meaning protecting them from being activated or silenced by the wrong regulatory elements. So to test this, we fragmented genomic DNA from a Hox cluster that patterns the posterior part of the fly. And so these are CTCF and CP190 chip seek tracks showing that these proteins bind at the boundaries between regulatory domains that each drive expression of Hox genes in specific body segments. So when we clone these random genomic fragments into a reporter assay, in which an enhancer is equidistant from a green and a red reporter gene, we saw that, so if the fragment is not an insulator, then GFP and M-Cherry were similarly activated in cells that were transiently transfected with this reporter. But if the fragment is an insulator, then M-cherry will be activated, but GFP will not, and it will only be expressed at basal levels. And moreover, this assay is quantitative. The stronger the insulator, the weaker GFP will be activated, expressed. So we found that specifically CTCF and CP190 binding sites have insulator activity, as you can see in these peaks. So this shows that at least in a reporter assay, CTCF and CP190 binding sites do not activate or repress transcription Instead, they block activation of a reporter gene by an enhancer. Okay, so, but how does CP190 loss affect natural gene expression in a fly? So to answer this, we looked at one of the best characterized developmental gene loci. So SCR and Antennapedia are two Hox genes that are interrupted by FOOTS, which is a pair rule gene that divides the embryo into segments. 
So SCR and FOOTS expression patterns do not overlap. You can see this in the merge. So FOOTS is expression is driven in stripes by stripe enhancers that are present within a contact domain that harbors FOOTS and its enhancers. Whereas SCR expression in a stripe is driven by a separate enhancer. So in CP190 mutants, now I'm going to toggle back and forth. You can look at the high C maps. You see that a foot's contact domain is still clearly visible, but the boundaries became fuzzy. And we saw that SCR is expressed in its endogenous stripe, and now additionally in seven weaker stripes that overlap foots. So this suggests that in the absence of CP190, foots enhancers are able to ectopically activate SCR transcription. So we conclude that CP190 therefore forms physical and regulatory boundaries that control the expression of important developmental body patterning genes. So the last point I want to make is that CP190 was originally proposed to be a looping factor. So what I mean by that is that CP190 would be recruited to different sites in the genome by interacting with DNA binding proteins that guide CP190 to different sites. Then CP190 would dimerize and thus organize the genome into a series of loops. So for example, it had been proposed in the case of SCR in FOOTS that CP190 dimerization would help FOOTS loop out to prevent crosstalk between SCR and FOOTS and also thereby bring SCR promoter closer to a distal enhancer, a putative distal enhancer that would be on the other side of FOOTS. But inconsistent with this model, we saw that SCR is still normally activated in its endogenous stripe, meaning it doesn't need to be you know, looped to a distal enhancer. So to further test this model, we used a beautiful transgenic assay that was originally developed by Miki Fujioka and James James. So the James lab previously identified an insulator that they called HOMI and it has remarkable properties. So HOMI here is in blue. It's an insulator that is endogenously present downstream of the developmental gene called even skip. And what the James lab found is that if you have transgenic HOMI present in a transgene up to 140 KB away from endogenous HOMI, transgenic HOMI can physically pair with endogenous HOMI forming a loop and bring reporter genes that are in the transgene close to transgenic HOMI in the vicinity of endogenous even skipped enhancers. And so when you look at how, for example, the GFP reporters expressed, they saw that GFP expression is governed by enhancers that here are labeled in green that are close to the transgene insertion site. And if you look at how LAXET is expressed, it's controlled by even skipped enhancers that I'm highlighting in pink. These are regions where even skipped enhancers drive expression. And because HOMI has this dual activity of mediating pairing, but also acting as an insulator, it prevents GFP from being expressed under even skipped enhancer patterns. And it prevents, uh, yeah, exactly. It prevents GFP from being expressed in, in even skipped expression patterns. So what we did was to introduce whole transgene into the CP190 mutant background. And what we found is that Homi was still able to pair over 140 kilobases with endogenous Homi and bring LAXED under the control of even skip enhancers. However, the only function of Homi that was impaired in CP190 mutants was its insulator function. And so we could see that now GFP became a little bit activated as well by at least the strongest even skip enhancers, which are active here. And also you can clearly see that LAGZ was also now being expressed under the control of in local enhancers that would normally only activate GFP. And so this showed, you know, we, we suggest that therefore this is strong evidence that CP190 is not simply a looping factor because it's specifically required for enhancer blocking activity 
of, of the classical homey insulator, but not its ability to mediate long range pairing. So with that, I'm just gonna summarize what we learned. First of all, we learned that whereas CTCF forms a, long fra a large fraction of mammalian contact domain boundaries, it's only required to form about 10% of boundaries in flies. And uh, second of all, whereas mammalian cells use CTCF to directly block cohesin extrusion at, at domain boundaries, flies use CP190 as an adapter protein that's recruited by CTCF and also by other DNA binding proteins to form robust boundaries. And so this demonstrated for the first time that diverse mechanisms evolved to partition genomes into independent regulatory domains that are important for development. So this was mainly the work of Anjali, who has since graduated, and she was helped a lot by Bihan as well, and supported by these other lab members. Julien Dorier performed all the computational analyses, and uh, this work also benefited from collaborations with Aristotle and Aiden, who taught us high key, and Simon Restrepo, who helped us in performing single molecule RNA fish. So I finished early, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. Wonderful talk, Maria. Really, thank you. Um, we do actually uh, already have a um, question with a um, raised hand, so I will allow you to talk now. I think you can unmute yourself, Felix, and ask a question. Yeah. So, okay, so I see that Felix Resilla Starga asks um, What is the evidence yeah, the that boundary formation relies on transcription? So, there I was referring to. So Nicola Iovino's lab published in, in Nature Communications last year that if you knock down um, an H2AZ chaperone, um, transcription of housekeeping gene promoters is decreased and the strength of promoter boundaries decreases. So I, I interpreted that as a correlation between boundary strength of promoter boundaries and the levels of transcription. And you mentioned that the courses lab had suggested had shown that CP190 interacts with RNA. I don't remember this study. I would have to check again. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So thanks. Yeah. So um, then we have Xinyan Bing. Is it not possible that CP190 is one of many looping factor and HOMI and HOMI utilizes other looping factors? Is this also consistent with the SCR distal tether retaining looping despite CP190 loss? Yeah, that's a fair point. It's a fair point. It could be that there's redundancy. So, you know, we haven't formally discarded that CP190 is not a looping factor because it could be that. CP190 loss is masked by redundant looping factors. It's a fair point. Um, however, so you, okay. Is this consistent with the SCR distal tether retaining looping despite CP190 loss? I don't think so because, um, so what I haven't shown you is that we also deleted in the DNA, we deleted the boundaries of the foot contact domain. And we see that when you delete um, one boundary, SCR is still expressed normally. I'm talking specifically about the boundary that's uh, on the right, on the right side of the foot's domain. So if, if boundary looping were important for SCR to be activated in its you know, pattern, then at least deleting the DNA should have disrupted that. And we didn't see that. Okay. Um, then I'll... Um stay on, on, on CTCF. So um, are the sequences recognized by CTCF, CTCF all the same? And uh, are the boundaries dependent on adjacent chromatin? Um, are they easily subclone into plasmid for, for, for studies? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I think what you might mean is, so I told you that there's this thing that we cannot explain, which is that when we, not all CTCF sites, shit peaks are co-bound by CP190. And intriguingly, they're all the ones with intermediate occupancy. So is there a difference in the CTCF motif that may distinguish, you know, those that are, 
the sites that are co-bound by CP1 and CTCF from those that are bound by CTCF alone, we were not able to find any differentially enriched motifs. However, we are testing whether the ability to recruit CP190 is dictated by the sequence itself um, or whether it's dictated by the chromatin context. So to test that, what you need to do is to take the, the sequence and jump it into a different you know, genomic location and ask whether this site is still always only recruiting CTCF or whether it can now recruit CP190 depending on where you've integrated it into. So that's what we're testing. Yeah. Connected to that, I actually have a question. Um, what is different between the location that recruits CTCF and CP190, but yeah. recruits CTCF and not CP1? So that, that's, it's clearly not CP190 alone. There's something right. there. Yeah, not, not CTCF alone there. There's something right. else that's regulating whether it can recruit CP190 or not. Could be. Do you have an idea? Yeah. So, you know, so actually, uh, the lab of, so Yuri Schwartz and, and Victor Corsi's were, were the first to, to notice that there are TTCF standalone sites. They, they found this in, in tissue culture cells. Um, although in tissue culture cells, you don't see this, uh, this striking correlation with uh, CTCF chip occupancy. But anyway, and, and they had, so, so Yuri Schwartz had already noticed that what they call, so they call these sites CTCF standalone, standalone peaks because they don't recruit CP190. They are more frequently enriched than expected in introns. And we see the same thing. However, it's not always true. It's not that all CTCF standalone peaks are always in introns because you could have imagined that, I don't know, maybe it's the fact of having transcription. So RNA polymerase progression that might be kicking CP190 off. That could be maybe true in the case of introns, but it's not. Um, we also you see know what percentages standalone. in introns. In introns, uh, I'd have to check. We mm -hmm. we know that it's statistically significantly enriched in introns, but it's it's not all of them. Okay, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> we have a bit more um, tangential question and potentially control. Controversial here mm -hmm. from Litzing Simon. So some people think that the Rosophila might not have loop extrusion by cohesin like mammals. Do yeah. you have any opinion on how this can or cannot work? Yeah. So you know, this is the question that we're all we're all asking ourselves. I think what's missing uh, is someone needs to do this conditional depletion of cohesin in fly cells and show that you lose contact domains, just like this has been shown very nicely in mammalian cells. So that, that definitive experiment is still missing. Um, what I can say is that, you know, uh, the Pan Daniel Panis lab in, in 2020 published a crystal structure showing that a, pepti a peptide in, in the n terminus CTCF can directly interact with a human cohesion subcomplex. And they identified two amino acids in human CTCF and terminus that are critical for this direct interaction. And this was hypothesized to be potentially the molecular basis for how CTCF may form directional boundaries uh, to, to, to loop extreme cohesion. Um, and actually we found that fly CTCF and terminus, even though if you align the N termini fly human CTCF, you, you hardly see any alignment except for this tiny portion containing these two amino acids. And we showed that fly CTCF and terminus directly interacts with, cohes with fly cohesin um, and that mutating the same amino acid also kills the interaction. So I would get, I, so for me, the most parsimonious explanation is that this is not by chance and that fly CTCF really does interact with cohesin in flies. We don't, so we know it, that it's not able to form a directional boundary. So maybe this direct interaction is not explaining why boundaries are directional, at least not in flies. But my guess would be that that contact domains are, are loop extruded in flies. But like I said, this has yet to be definitively shown. Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks. So we have another one 
uh, from Xinjiang again. I'm sorry for the pronunciation of the name. So what is your best hypothesis for uh, how insulators actually work uh, molecularly? Generally, it's thought that because it seems that loop extrusion is not the main mechanism in um, that formation. Yeah, that is the million dollar question. And that's what we're trying to understand. So, hmm, I also think that at least in flies, loop extrusion might not be explaining insulation. So, mm -hmm. you know, from there's this, there's a hypothesis, right? That cohesion, that CTCF is directing cohesion traffic, right? And that maybe being co extruded, the fact of co extruding a promoter and an enhancer might be important for their functional communication. Um, you know, the fact that we were able to reconstitute insulation in a transiently transfectable reporter essay in fly cells. And we've done many experiments, but I haven't had time to show you. But basically, we, we this model does not explain. Um, insulation in our reporter system. And we're instead exploring alternative mechanisms that we think might have to do something with topology itself. So supercoiling and things like that. So at that level, um, but this is still, it's very speculative. We have yet to you know, nail this, but, but that's the direction that we think uh, might be at least worth exploring. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, I'll then just take a, an extra one just for curiosity. So you showed this um, very nice example of the enhancer hijacking um, for, for the for SCR. Uh, and this model where uh, you were saying that it was told that um, CP190 would loop out the regions and isolate it from there. But then and then the loop was um, mediated by CP190, but then if you deplete CP190, it, it doesn't really matter. So what do you think is actually driving it there? Ah, so you mean SCR expression in its endogenous stripe? So we think actually that uh, the enhancer that's responsible for driving SCR in this stripe is actually not this putative distal one. Okay. Uh, we, we, we actually, uh, you know, Alex Stark, has this wonderful resource, this database where you can look at uh, in vivo uh, expression patterns driven by genomic fragments, right? And you see clearly an enhancer that seems to drive expression in the SCR stripe that's that's close by, actually. Okay. Uh, and it's not on the other side. So that that's, you know, but yes, yes, exactly. So, so it's mostly an annotation, enhancer annotation issue. I, I think so, okay. I think so. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the cheapest explanation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so okay, we have a very short one that is probably the last we can ask. Um, is it possible to, to detect polymorphisms between alleles on CTCF boundaries that could explain gene expression variation? Hmm. Yeah, it's a wonderful experiment. So. Um... Looking at inbred lines and expression and CTCF binding and trying to correlate them. Yeah, that's a good idea for my next. Week, so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very interesting question. Thank you. Okay, then I would like to thank everyone, both our speakers, all the attendees, and uh, if there's no any other question we can uh, close the session here and see you in two weeks and please if you uh, attended the journal clubs uh, before please catch the uh, link in the chat for uh, providing feedback on um, how we improve the uh, journal club from the project so thanks everyone again and see you in a couple of weeks